What I'm going to teach you today is going to be some of the theories that are expressed in chapter two. But I also want to share with you this amazing adventure that I went on when I learned how to take the dreaming process and teach other people. My faculty development leave that I went on for an entire year blends perfectly with chapter two because I believe that in order to dream, we have to know who we are. And in order to know who we are, we have to dream. So these two fit seamlessly, and this is the kickoff for the Empowering the Dream project. So let's get started. To begin dreaming, I'm going to use the acronym DREAM. So this is the D part of dream, is you have to discover who you are. This is the slide that I would like for you to write down today. The self-concept is the idea or mental image we have about our abilities, our knowledge, our personality. It's what we carry around in our suitcase that we bring into every communication encounter that we have. How is our self-concept formed? Well, we have to know a little bit about who we are and the talents we possess, and then we present them to other people and get a reaction from other people, and that yields the self-concept. For example, Let's say that I really have taught myself how to play the guitar. And I sit in my room every night and I strum on the guitar and I've learned some new songs. But I haven't shared my music with anyone. Well, I'm not a musician. I'm just a person who learned how to play the guitar sitting in my room. I don't become the musician until I share that with other people and they go, wow, Antonio, you're a really good guitar player. Same thing could go for art. I could doodle all day long in my notebook. I could have a beautiful portfolio, but until I share that art with someone and they go, you're an artist. I'm just someone that doodles on paper. Who we are coupled with who other people tell us we are, we become. I knew when I was in the fifth grade that I wanted to be a teacher. Miss Bergini was the best teacher I ever had. I wanted to be just like her. In fact, in the afternoons, I would come home and I'd put all my dolls and all my stuffed animals on the front porch. And then I'd get a chalkboard out and I'd create lessons on the chalkboard. And then I'd begin to teach my animals. And I absolutely loved it. But when I talked to my parents and my friends and others as I was growing up, they said, you don't want to be a teacher. You're too smart for that. You need to be a broadcaster. You need to go and do public relations. But you don't want to be a teacher. So I, I left my dream of teaching aside. I let other people convince me that wasn't what I wanted to become. So fast forward many years. I'm in my late 20s, and I had the opportunity to go back to graduate school to get a master's degree in speech communication. And my husband and I, we were, we were pretty poor, and when I went to get my degree, I was asked, would you like to be a teaching assistant and help teach three different speech classes? I was really nervous, but like I said before, we needed the money. So I said, okay, it's a paying job, I'll take it, and I can go to school at the same time. The moment I walked into that classroom, I fell in love. I enjoyed it so much, getting to be with students and to help them learn how to better their life. But it wasn't until the end of the semester till I became a teacher. When students filled out that evaluation and they wrote things like, this is the best class I've ever had. Or another student wrote, Carol, could you learn how to teach biology and history and psychology? I'd take any class that you ever had to offer. Who I think I am, coupled with who other people tell me I am, I become. I became a teacher that day and I've never looked back. So what are some different ways that you can enhance that self-concept? Because if you want to dream big, you got to learn who you are. So what are some ways you can learn who you are? The first thing that you can do to enhance your self-concept is be all that you can be, nothing more, nothing less. Our military used this phrase for a while in their ad campaign. Be all that you can be. But I want to add to that. Nothing more, nothing less. Sometimes we strive to do things that are above our skills. 
that are above our abilities, or we put ourselves in jobs that we're really not happy with, but we do it for the money. But I don't want you to sell yourself short and be less than you're supposed to become. Example, I love being a community college teacher. As I've told you before in this class, community college students are my heroes. You inspire me every day I walk in because I used to be you. I know the challenges you face and the struggles and the sacrifice you are making to be here. But being more than I'm capable of being is a university professor. Well, isn't it the same? No, actually it's not. I've been there and I've done that. I taught full time at the University of North Texas and Tarrant County College for one year. And I'd walk out at University of North Texas and I'd walk out on this stage and there'd be 500 students sitting there taking notes. And then I was over 26 teaching assistants who they were the ones that were working with the students in the class. And I thought it was okay until I was sitting in an Applebee's restaurant one night with my family. All of a sudden, this beautiful waitress comes around the corner and goes, oh, hi, Carol. Oh, you must be Philip. We've heard all about you. And oh, baby Andrew, aren't you cute? And Eric, mm-hmm, she's told some pretty nice stories about you. And my kids are looking at me like, who is this chick? My husband's looking at me like, what have you told her? And I didn't know my student's name. I couldn't introduce her to my family, and I didn't know her story. And I thought, that's not why. I got into teaching. I got into teaching to learn from my students, to be inspired for them, not to walk out on a stage and not know who was sitting in my audience. And that was very, very telling for me. The other thing about being a university professor is you have to write. Either you publish or you perish. And writing is not my gift. It's not something I enjoy. So here I was teaching 500 students at one time whose name I never knew and I was going back into an office and I was having to write for the rest of the day. It was more than I wanted to do. But on the other hand, don't sell yourself short. Don't do something less. Less for me would be teaching third graders. I don't like children. Now I know that sounds awful and I love my own children, but putting me in a class with a bunch of third graders all day long, sheer misery. Be all that you can be, nothing more, nothing less. Figure out what your groove is and what you're comfortable and what makes you happy doing it. I've told you, this classroom is my happy place and this is where I'm becoming the most of what I'm supposed to become. Second thing that you can do to be, enhance your, enhance your self-concept is recognize and admit your limitations. Recognize and admit your limitations. I used to teach that by the time you're 25 years old that your brain has pretty much solidified, that your personality is set. What we have discovered is that is not true. Through neuroscience is now joining the social science bandwagon, we have learned that the brain is plastic that the brain is always going to grow, that we can always learn anything. That's what I love. We can learn anything. So if I recognize my limitations and I admit them and I know what's holding me back from something, I know that I can train my brain to learn how to do it. I just confess to you that writing is not my gift. Somehow when I was going through the education system and my family was transferring schools, I missed grammar and punctuation and how to put a sentence together correctly. And so I've always been very fearful. Whenever I've written an email, I will sit there for 15 or 20 minutes with writer's block, I'll write the email, I'll go back over it again, and I still am nervous when I hit send. Because I'm afraid that someone's gonna find out that I'm not a very good writer and therefore I shouldn't be a teacher. I wanted to go on a sabbatical. I wanted to prove that this dreaming process is so important for you to have a good life that I knew I needed to take a year to study it. And I wanted to go on a faculty development leave. Tarrant County College will pay teachers their entire year salary to go and study on a project. And I wanted to do an FDL, but there's one catch. I had to write a 40-page proposal and present it to the dean. Now what did I just tell you my limitation was? Right. Writing. So I'm going to have to write it. And so I went to my English faculty and I told them, I'm not a good writer. I get writer's block all the time. Could I take your basic English class? And they laughed at me. You don't need to take a basic English class. Yes, 
I really do. And I convinced one beautiful English teacher on our campus, her name is Angela Chilton. And I went to Angela and I said, I really need your help. Would you allow me to take your technical writing class? And she did. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I got better. And I got more confident in my writing. But it took me, it took me actually going and saying to people, I need help. Here's my limitation. It's stopping me from advancing and helping my students. What can we do together? And I was talking to Angela about it one day and I said, oh, thank you for helping me. I feel so much more confident in my writing skills. And she said, Carol, if I came to you as an English faculty and said, would you help me put together a speech? I have to do this big presentation in front of all these people. Would you laugh at me? I went, oh, no. I'd get with you, and we'd practice that speech and practice that speech and practice that speech until you felt really confident about giving it. She said, exactly. We're here to help one another. All of us have challenges we need to face. We just need to admit them and then ask people for their help. The third way you can enhance your self-concept is surround yourself with positive people. My goal every time you come into class is that you leave here better. You're happier. You have a better attitude. I want to surround myself with positive people because I know that positivity breeds positivity. Now, I know we can't have 100% of positive people in our life, but we need to surround ourselves with the happy ones because it's the happy ones that make a difference. And last, oh, here we go. I hope you're ready. You need to feed yourself positive words. Six weeks, six weeks of feeding yourself the same positive word, you will become that word. So I've asked you every day when you come to class to have a word of the day. Yes? yes. What's your word of the day? Enthusiastic. What is it? En en enthusiastic. 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 Awesome. Somebody else, what's your word today? Radiant. Radiant? Ecstatic. Ecstatic. What else? Ready. Ready. What else? Beautiful you are, Ruby. You're beautiful. Yes, we want to have these words because they can shape our lives. If you want to be happy, you truly can hardwire your brain to be happy. So we're going to surround ourselves with positive words. You are what you think. You are what you think. If you think you're awesome, you're beautiful, you're energetic, you're enthusiastic, you're ready, guess what? You are and you can do it on a daily basis. I wake up every morning and I feed myself a positive word. Some days it's beautiful hair. Some days it's happy. Some days it's you are so blessed. Some days it's I'm thankful. I'm thankful I have a job. Every single day I feed my words. Buddha once, once wrote, all that we are is a result of all that we have thought. How true. All that we are is a result of all that we have thought. So if we think we're awesome, if we think we're capable, if we think we're worthy, what do we become? Capable, worthy, and awesome. Language is a wonderful way to create who we are. So the four ways that you can enhance yourself and concept, just by leaving here today, you can start working on this, is to be all that you can be, nothing more, nothing less. Admit and recognize your limitations, surround yourself with positive people, and feed yourself positive words. This leads to our self-esteem. This is another slide I want you to write down. The self-esteem is the positive or negative evaluation of the self-concept. This is whether or not you like yourself. This is your attitude. Your self-esteem is your attitude about your capabilities, your knowledge, your personality, and your skills. I need you to have a healthy, high self-esteem. Four reasons that I want you to have a healthy, high self-esteem. First of all, people who have a healthy, high self-esteem are happier and have a higher degree of life satisfaction. Secondly, people who have a healthy, high self-esteem will take more risk and challenges and embark on more adventures. Third, people who have a high self-esteem don't mind others watching them when they express their talents and gifts. And we want people to watch us express our talents and our gifts because that feeds the self-concept. And the fourth reason and why you should really be working on this this semester is you make more money. 
People with a higher self-esteem will make more money than those who do not. Now, if you'd like another red ticket, I know a lot of you in here are collecting them, I would encourage you to go to Google and do self-esteem inventory. Just use that as your prompt, your search, self-esteem inventory. There's numerous personality inventories out there. Take the self-esteem inventory, bring it back to me in class, I'll give you a red ticket. And then at the end of the semester, let's take it again and see how our self-esteem has improved. By taking this speech class and having to work together in groups and listen to some of my crazy lectures and my song of the day, and by you doing a public presentation in here, it is my hope that your self-esteem will increase. So how can we in, how can we improve our communication with the self-esteem? Well, first of all, use positive words, which is I've been kind of hammering all semester. Secondly, reframe. When negative things happen to you, or negative things or not so positive things happen, flip it around and ask yourself, what can I learn from this lesson? You know, we're all afraid of failure, but I think Nicole Curtis, she's the DIY rehab addict, I think she says it perfectly when she says that mistakes they're just knowledge waiting to happen. We can learn from every encounter that we're in. If we'll take that situation, reframe it and say, what was I supposed to learn from that? Gratitude. Gratitude. When you are thankful, it lights up certain centers in your brain. It produces serotonin. It produces adrenaline. It produces endorphins. What are you thankful for? I was telling students yesterday, and I'm going to encourage you to do this as well. If we would sit down every morning and just come up with five reasons that we're thankful, it could really flip our day around. And so what I wanted them to do, those of you who are coming from the east, you're coming from 35, um, coming towards the, the college, you're going west, there's a sign where you're going to get off on Blue Mountain Road, and it has all the different restaurants and, and gas stations there. And there's a QT there. And I see that sign every morning. And for the QT stands for quite thankful. And so every morning when I see that QT sign, I go, here's what I am quite thankful for. I am thankful that the stomach bug that I had last night receded so I could be here today. I am thankful for my husband. I am thankful for my students. I am thankful I got to go on a great adventure last year. And I am thankful that I live in one of the best countries in the world. Every single day, I come up for reasons why I am quite thankful. It's a trigger. I see it now. The brain, after six weeks, it fires. OK, Carol, what are you thankful for today? So I want you to get a trigger. Get that billboard. Because we can, we can spend time on the negative side, but you live in one of the freest, best countries in the world. You have lots to be thankful for. So gratitude is another way that can increase our self-esteem. Honest relationships. Yes, I like it when people tell me all the time that I'm fun and I'm special and I'm wonderful, but I want people to be honest with me. How can I get better? How can I get better? And I found that people that really love me are the ones that are most honest. And the last is to visualize. What do you want your world to look like? Visualize what you want your world to look like. I've told you that today we start on the Empowering the Dream program, and I asked you at the beginning of the semester, can I borrow this, Jacob? And I asked you at the semester to buy a white notebook. Remember a notebook that had a sleeve in it? Okay. Well, at the end of the year, end of the semester, you're going to create a visualization piece that you're going to slip in here that will show you what you want your life to look like in the coming years. There's a wonderful story by a man by the name of John Arasaf in the book called The Passion Test. And before John was rich and famous, he would do these vision boards every year. And he decided eight to 10 years ago that when he got rich and famous, that he wanted to buy a beautiful house in California overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And so he's looking through magazines, Architectural Digest to be exact, and he cut out this picture of this beautiful house and put it on his vision board. Fast forward, seven years later, he and his little boy were moving into this brand new house. And the little boy was asking his dad about all these vision boards. And the dad was explaining that a vision board is a collection of visual representations of what you want your life to look like in the coming year. And the dad was going from the current year back seven years. And all of a sudden, the little boy pulls out the one from seven years ago. And he goes, Dad, how did you know seven years ago that we'd be moving into this house? The house that the dad had put on the vision board was the exact same house that they moved into seven years later. Every 
Christmas time, New Year's, I do a vision board. And now I have my whole family doing this vision board. And we put what we want our life to look like. Usually by June, everything that we've put on that vision board has transpired. I can tell you that I put things on there and I don't know how it's going to work out, but for some reason it works out. I'll give you an example that just happened to me recently. I need a new computer. My computer at home has died. And so last, last January I put a beautiful little picture of a Surface Pro. I thought, I want to investigate these Surface Pros because I think they'd be kind of neat to have a tablet that has a USB port, that has a little keyboard that I could take all around. Then I started pricing them. And I knew with us saving money for my son Andrew's college that I couldn't afford it. They're $700 to $1,000. So I just said, oh, well, th that's not going to happen this year. So this past June, I had to take a blended learning workshop. And at the end of the workshop, the instructor said, so for the first 60 people that put their blended course together and get it approved, they're going to get a brand new Surface Pro 3. Whoop, whoop. Who do you think got one? So, okay, maybe I worked a little bit harder because I knew it was a goal, but if you want to attain a goal, first you've got to name it. Every single thing I put on these vision boards will generally happen. So if you want to be successful in life, you want your self-esteem to increase, visualize yourself being successful. I talked about reframing this idea about taking something that may not be turning out as well as we thought and looking at it in a new light. This past year, I had the opportunity to go to Tahiti with my husband. And we were going on a 10-day cruise. And during the cruise, I was going to interview Jean-Michel Cousteau. It was one of these dreams that I've always had. But I also had another dream. And that dream was to stay in one of those little tiki huts that are over the ocean at the end of the dock. I wanted just water surrounding me. Well, my husband surprised me. And we left a few days early. And we went and stayed at one of these beautiful huts in Morea, which is in French Polynesia. So I'm sitting on my, my, little, on my patio of my little hut that morning, and that was my view. That was my view from the little back porch. And I started complaining. I started complaining, and here's my thought process. This isn't what I wanted. I wanted a hut that was completely surrounded by water. I don't want to have to look at land. I want to be in the middle of the ocean. And you know you have those, those inner critics that are going on in your head, and the other one's going, are you kidding me, Carol? You're in Tahiti, and you're complaining about where you're staying? And then another voice said, if you don't like where you're looking, look left. Look left. I looked left, and guess what? I was surrounded by water. Sometimes we need to take a situation and just look at it from a different perspective and then it makes sense. That's what reframing is and that can enhance our self-esteem. The last slide, that, another slide I want you to write down, we've had self-concept, self-esteem. This next one is called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy. And self-efficacy says that based upon who we think we are, and how we like ourselves, this predicts how, what's going to happen if we engage in other situations. For example, I love talking about this stuff. I love giving workshops. Jacob's Church calls me and says, we hear that you like giving dream workshops. Would you come present at our church? Well, because I've done this presentation before and because I've been successful and I have a high self-esteem when it comes to doing these kind of presentations, I'm going to say yes and I know I'm probably going to be successful. Who in here likes math? You like taking math classes, okay? What math are you taking right now? Uh, intermediate algebra. Intermediate algebra. Which one are you taking? The same. Intermediate algebra, okay. And you, do you think they're going to be successful in the class? How come? I'm the only one that completed the whole chapter. Okay. And you, have you been successful in math classes in the past? Yeah. Yeah, so your self-esteem when it comes to math. Who are my writers in here? Anyone like to write? No, all of you are with me, so you understood when I said I didn't, I didn't like to write. Uh, so that's what self-efficacy is. We make a prediction about our success based upon our self-esteem. There's some other ways we can assess perceptions of self. Self-actualization, I do want you to write this down. Self-actualization is the highest form of self. Self-actualization is the highest form of self. Self-actualization is where we act upon the gifts that we've been given. Self-actualization is the highest form of self. Self-adequacy is a belief that we can do it. 
and we don't ever want to enter into self-denigration. Self-denigration is that negative shadow. That's the inner critic in our voice that goes, you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, you couldn't. We need to tell that shadow to go away. So what I'm wanting you to see from this slide is the self-concept, which is the knowledge of the self. That leads to the feelings about the self, the attitude. That's our self-esteem. And then that predicts whether we're going to be successful or not. So that was the D part, okay, discover you. Now we're going to talk about the R part of dreaming, rejoice in your drummer. Goethe once wrote, those born with a talent which is meant to be used find their greatest joy in using it. A friend of mine said, Carol, you don't know how not to teach. Every time you find something new and you make some discovery, you can't wait to run back to our group and tell us about it. That's my greatest joy. That's my greatest joy because that's my talent. My goal this semester is to help you discover what your talent is and therefore it will become your greatest joy. Look, it's not about the money. It really is not. I've been there, I've done that. It's not about the money. It's about doing something that you were born to do that you absolutely love. I believe by pursuing our dreams and by pursuing our passions that we will learn what that is that we truly love. How can we like who we are better? How can we rejoice in that beat? Well, understand that life is a series of choices. You chose to be here today. I chose to be here. I definitely could have backed out today and said, I'm sick, I'm not feeling well. But there are consequences for our choices, aren't there? You choose to be here. You choose to be a good student. You choose to study. You choose the occupation that you're going to go in. To me, this is freeing. Because if life is all about choices, I get to control what I choose. The other way we can learn about our drummer is I want to give you a permission to take a risk. Get out there and try things. You know what I discovered about when I interviewed people all around the world about dreaming? I discovered two reasons why people don't dream. The first reason that people don't dream is they're afraid they're not going to come true. People are afraid they're going to embark on this passion and they're going to try it and it's not going to happen. And so they're afraid to even start. The second reason people don't dream, and this is the one, it still floors me. The second reason people don't dream is they're afraid they will come true. What? They're afraid that they're going to embark on the dream, it's going to happen, and they're not going to be happy with the results. They say it's just better not to do it. Go do it. Go try it. If you don't like it, okay, then back away. Several years ago, in challenging from my, I got a challenge from my students, and it was, you have the easiest job. You walk in, you talk about speech communication, your students love you, you don't know what it's like in the real world. You're kind of a slacker. Oh, okay. And so I thought, I'll show you. So I went out and I got my real estate license. I, my dad was a realtor. One of my dreams was to be a realtor. And I can tell you, I made a lot of money selling real estate. The first summer I sold real estate, I made more money in one summer than I made in a whole year of teaching. But I have to tell you, I hated every single minute of it. That wasn't my bliss. That wasn't, that wasn't my joy. Well, some people would say, you're going to quit real estate? You made a lot of money. You sent your kids to college. It's been a really good, good experience for you. I said, no, it's not. I lay in bed at night and I stress over these deals that I'm making. Am I doing them a good job? Am I, am I finding them the right house? And then there's all this angst. The biggest fight I ever had between two people in real estate, a buyer and a seller, was over bar stools. $700,000 house and these people are fighting over $100 bar stools. I saw the best and the worst in people and I just didn't like it. And then another person said, well, you can't quit now. You spent all this time getting your real estate degree and you're really good at it. I said, but it doesn't matter if I don't like it. But let me reframe. Let me reframe. What did I learn from real estate? I learned how to negotiate a contract. I learned what to look for in a house. I learned how to do an appraisal so if I know that the house I'm buying is worth it. But I also learned a little bit about rejection. I learned about asking people for their business, and when they told me no, I learned how not to take it personally. It has definitely affected my teaching career in a positive way. So get out there and take risks. It's like I said, Nicole Curtis said, they're just mistakes waiting to happen. You might not 
you might not try, you might not like it, but if you don't do it, you're already starting with a no. So take these risks. And last one, never say what if. Never say what if. If it's the harder road that you have to take, but it's going to lead to your passion, take the harder road. So I told you the story about wanting to do a proposal for a faculty development leave. And I'm working with Angela Chilton, and I write this proposal, a 40-page proposal, and I'm coming to give it to the dean. The dean at that time was Christine Hubbard, my boss, but she was a former English teacher. And I am taking this proposal for her to review. As I'm driving from Denton to Tarrant County, I'm talking myself out of it. Uh, you can't turn that in. TCC is not going to give you a year's salary to go on a dream quest, to go talk to people. This is a stupid idea. I had all these little shadows and inner critic just in my ear. And I called my husband because my husband's wonderful. And if I told him that I was afraid and I didn't want to do it, he'd give me permission not to do it. He'd, be, he'd support me no matter what. Well, praise God, Eric didn't answer the phone. So I got here, and I'm walking into Dr. Hubbard's office, and I literally was shaking. Here's my greatest fear, my biggest challenge writing, and I'm going to give it to an English teacher to see if I can go away for a year and study the dreaming process. And she's sitting there very quietly, and she's flipping through my proposal. And when she finishes, she shuts it, and she looks at me, and she goes, this is one of the best proposals I've ever seen. If for some reason Tarrant County College doesn't give you the sabbatical, we'll figure out as a division how to make it happen for you. Yay! But think about my what if I almost said, I'm not going to turn it in. What if I hadn't have turned it in? Definitely would not have had one of the best years of my life. I'll tell you another thing I know. I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now. Two years ago, I was completely burned out of teaching. I had given and given and given, and I had been through some true tragedy in those four years, and I was just done. I was done with teaching. And I took a step back, and I went around the world, and I kept talking, and what I kept finding was I kept being drugged back into situations where I had to teach. And finally, I had this, I caught my Amadeus moment when I went, oh my gosh, this is my happy place. And I came back and I taught summer two and I loved it and my passion for teaching was reignited. Was it difficult? Yeah. Did I have to learn some things? Sure. But never say what if. If it's the hard decision, go for it. You might be really surprised with what you find out. So let's look at some other famous people and their drummers and their what if moments. That first guy is Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is known as who? He was a baseball player, and what, what, was he, what did he set a record for? Uh, a lot of home runs. Most home runs in a season, right? Babe Ruth. Did you know that same year that he had the most home runs in a season, he also was the king of the strikeouts? The same year he was the home run king, he was also the strikeout king. Let's look at this other guy in the bottom right-hand corner. That's Walt Disney. I love Walt Disney. Walt Disney was fired from his first job as a news reporter on a newspaper because he, quote, lacked any good ideas. He was also told the mouse will never work. Well, you all know this next lady, Oprah Winfrey. She was fired from her first job as a news broadcaster and was told, you are unfit for television. You need to go do something else. This next guy is Steven Spielberg. We all love Steven Spielberg's movies. Steven Spielberg was rejected twice from the University of Southern California in film school. Went to another school, made more films. What I think is really interesting is in 1994 and 1996, USC conferred honorary degrees on him. If it would have been me, I probably wouldn't have taken them. I would have said, you didn't want me the first time? You're not going to have me now. And then this last guy, most of us carry Steve Jobs around in our pocket. Steve Jobs was fired from the company that he made. And he had to reinvent himself. All of these people had their what if moments. All of these people had other people tell them, you're not worthy, you're no good, this is not going to work. And they looked at him and said, that's not me. My self-concept, my self-esteem is higher than that. I think knowing Oprah, what she probably said is, I'll come back and I'll prove it to you. I'm going to make you eat those words. Don't let other people tell you what you can or cannot be. That's only for you to decide and you get to choose that. So let's talk about this idea of gift and shadow, right? I want you here. 
I want you on the positive side. I want you to love who you are. I want you to act on the gifts that you have, and that's going to lead to your passion. This is your gift. But sometimes we walk in the negative, and we believe that we are not worthy of what we're pursuing. And that leads to inactivity. Why should we even try? It's not going to work for me anyway. Why should I try? And that leads to disbelief. Those are those inner critics. Those are those shadows. And every single one of us in here, myself included, have them. Why don't you think about something? I've played with shadows a little bit. If I am walking away from the sun, away from the light, where is my shadow? Right. It's in front of you. It's in, and the further I get away from it, the bigger the shadow. But if I'm walking towards the light, where is my shadow? It's behind you. And when I say light, I'm talking about enlightenment. If we will walk towards getting to know who we are, getting to try new things, getting out there and discovering our dreams and our passions, we will enlighten ourselves and those shadows are going to be kept at bay. It's when we walk away from who we are, when we don't trust that gut, knowing that this is who I'm supposed to be, that we walk in the shadow and we become overshadowed. And when we become overshadowed, we cease to try. Don't do that. Believe, believe that you're capable of doing whatever you set your mind to and walk towards enlightenment. Now, I want to help you with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody a little sticky note. I'll pass out these stickies. I want you to claim your shadow. All right, I want you to pass it. Everybody take one. I want you to claim your shadow. What is it? What is it that you fear that's holding you back from becoming who you're supposed to be? For me, it was a fear of rejection. I was, af I was afraid I was going to be found out. I was afraid that the president of the college would go, you can't write. You have no business being a college teacher. That, those were my shadows. Those were the inner critics. What I want you to do, just rip one off and pass it back. I want you to write your shadow. Do not write your name. I don't want to know who it is. But I want you to identify your shadow. What is it that you're afraid of? What's holding you back? Is it addiction? Is it family problem? Is it finances? Is it friends? Is it your fear of rejection, your fear of failure? Is it a fear of that you don't know who you are? So I want you to write them down. And when you're ready, I want you to come stick them on the door right here. And then I want you to go back to your seats. So come on up one at a time. And let's put them right here. Everybody has a shadow, so everyone should be writing up. Just take them right there. Come on. Thank you, my dear. Albert. Thank you, sir. Miss Cheyenne. Thank you, dear. Everybody got one up here? What'd you do to your knee? I had surgery on it a while back oh, okay. and with the weather. Yeah, it's hurting. It hurt. yeah. Any more? All right. Thank you very much. All right, so some of our shadows up here are a budget, rejection, failure, negative opinions, and maybe, and maybe the wrong choice. Maybe I made the wrong choices. My, my, my fear, my shadow is talking in front of people. My fear is people judging me. My fear is knowing how to go where I want to go. My fear is failing to reach my dream. Not if you're in my class. I'm helping with that one. My fear is wasting time. My fear of finances. That I'm not smart enough. My, my fear is a relapse of memory. That would, that would be fearful. Fear of rejection. Fear of not being enough. Not sure what I want to be. I'm afraid of failing. My knee problem. So here's the deal. Thank you for trusting me with your shadows, your shadows. I'm going to keep them for the rest of the semester. You no longer have them. Knee problem, it's going to go away. 
Fear of public speaking, I'm going to help you with that. Fear of not knowing what you want to do, we're going to work on that this semester. The last day of class on our final exam, when you come into class, I'm going to have these posted on that back door. And when you leave class, you get to choose. You can choose either to take that shadow back and walk away with it, or you can choose to let me keep them and I'll put them in the trash where they belong. Let's spend the next 12 to 14 weeks shadow free and let's see where it takes us. Will you work with me on that? Will you trust me to help you figure out your dreams and help with this rejection idea and all the different fears that you have? Getting rid of your shadows is liberating because once you unpack them from your suitcase, guess what? You have a whole suitcase on your person that you get to pack the good stuff in, the positive stuff. Now, I talked about some famous drummers, but I want to tell you about my favorite drummer. My favorite drummer is my brother, Sean. Sean and I are nine months apart. Now, I know you're not going to find this hard to believe, but I was the good girl in the family. If mom said be home at 11 o'clock, I was home at 1030. I made good grades. I played the right sports. I never caused my parents any worry. Sean was the child from hell. He did everything in his power to cause discord in my family. My parents fought and fought and fought over Sean. And by the time we were a sophomore and I was a junior in high school, we didn't like one another very much. Sean's dream was to be a professional surfer. And so we'd go to school in the morning and I'd be driving and Sean would look at the flagpoles. And if the flagpoles were flying stiff in the breeze, he'd say, Give me the car keys. I'm going surfing today. You, you, you can't go surfing. We got to go to school. Ah, I'm not going to graduate from high school. I'm going to be a professional surfer. That did not sit well with me, but I gave him the keys. By the time we've now, I'm a senior and Sean is a junior, we're barely speaking to one another because my brother is an embarrassment to me because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Sean ran away from home during my senior year and when I say ran I mean he literally ran away from home because he had no transportation and he ran down to the intercoastal waterway. The reason that he was running away from home was because my parents discovered that my brother had a pot farm growing on the roof of our home. Now his little marijuana weed habits were not good especially since my mother is the sheriff's secretary. Yeah, that's right. Oh, crap. So they have this big fight. Sean leaves the house. He runs down to the intercoastal waterway, and he hot wires three different luxury yachts. He'd hot wire a yacht, and he'd drive it to run out of gas. He'd hot wire another one until it ran out of gas. When the police finally caught up with my brother, he wasn't hiding in a car. He wasn't hiding in a building. My brother was hiding in a tree. Who hides in a tree? Huh? <laughs> he couldn't even get that one right. I can honestly tell you that I hated my brother. I felt hate for another human being because he was just causing so much difficulty in my family. Fast forward to three years and I'm at Florida State University and I've just completed a reading assignment, a book called Love by Leo Buscalia. And when I finished this book, the teacher came in and she gave the class an assignment that we were to call someone that we hadn't told in a long time that we loved them and let them know that we care about them. I chose Sean. Not because I loved Sean. I didn't. Not because I was proud of Sean. I really wasn't. I called Sean because Sean was getting ready to embark upon his dream of becoming a professional surfer. And he had purchased a one-way ticket and was going to start his dreams in Puerto Rico. I also knew that my brother was still dealing drugs and that he would probably be arrested and I would never see him again. And I didn't want there to be any guilt. So I get Sean on the phone and he goes, what do you want? You see, he didn't like me either. And I said, Sean, I know we haven't always seen eye to eye. He goes, boy, that's an understatement. I said, but just listen for a minute. I want to let you know that I admire you. I think what you're doing is so courageous. And I wish I had one tenth of your courage and I was able to take risk like you. I admire that you're chasing your dream. I'm expecting some kind of reconciliation. Oh, we have this nice chit chat. My brother hung up the phone. <laughs> Click. And my first thought wasn't, he hung up the phone. My first thought wasn't, well, that didn't go very well. My only thought was, now I have nothing to write about. You see, it was still all about me.
Well, Sean went to Puerto Rico, and Sean went to Africa, and Sean went to South America, and Sean went to California, and Sean went to Hawaii, and Sean went to Australia. Sean traveled and surfed every single major coast that this world has to offer, and at one point in his life was making over 60 grand a year surfing for impact surfboards. He followed his dream because he was real. Out of all of the aunts and uncles that my children have, Uncle Sean is their favorite. Because Uncle Sean, what you see is what you get. When I, the children were small, we'd go home to Florida for the summer, and their favorite day of the entire summer was getting to go fishing with Uncle Sean. Uncle Sean had a little John boat and had a little outboard motor, and he would take them through the intercoastal waterways. And their whole goal was to catch something they could cook for dinner that night on one of the little spoil islands. Now, Carol had rules. And these rules were you may not go in the inlet, which takes you out to the ocean, and do not take these small children on the ocean. Okay, okay, we got it, we got it. So they come back and they've had a great day. They went spear fishing and snorkeling and caught some different clams that they grilled on this open fire. They were sunburned, but they were safe. They had a great day. Two months later, we're sitting back here in Texas and we're watching Discovery Channel's Shark Week. And all of a sudden, a hammerhead comes across the screen. And Emily goes, Mama, I've seen one of those. <laughs> and Philip goes, shh. <laughs> and I go, no, baby, you've never, you've never seen a hammerhead. We've never been to SeaWorld. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And we were fishing in the inlet with Uncle Sean. And Philip goes, Emily, shut up. Shut up. And I go, time out. Inlet. Philip goes, yeah. Uncle Sean was cool. The water was smooth as glass, crystal clear. You could see all the way down to the bottom. And Emily goes, yeah, yeah, Uncle Sean was reeling in a jack, and all of a sudden this hammerhead came out of nowhere, bigger than the boat, and snap, swallowed the fish whole and was dragging us out to sea. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hyperventilating, picturing this small boat, killer shark, dragging my children out to sea. And I get Sean on the phone, and I go, what were you thinking? He goes, I, Carol, I had it under control. All I had to do was cut the line. I would never let anything happen to your children. We go back the next summer. Do you think I went over the rules one more time? No inlet, no ocean, only intercoastal. Kids go, same, same scenario. They have a great, great day. Get back and I look at Sean and I go, any adventures you want to tell me about? Oh no, oh no, we did just like you said. We stayed in the intercoastal. I'm tucking Emily into bed that night, and Emily goes, Mama, you want to know a secret? And I was like, okay. We helped rescue a man out of an airplane that crashed in the intercoastal today. Now, Emily's a lot like her mama. She exaggerates, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, she saw one of those planes that have the pontoons, a water plane that land, but, you know, no biggie, and I'm just, yes, yeah, sweet, sweet girl, good night. The next morning, I'm going out to have coffee talk on the back porch with my father. And I sit down, and my father has the newspaper, and he has it folded in half, and he hands it to me, and he goes, you might want to take a look at the front page of the newspaper. And I open it up, and there is an airplane that has crashed into the intercoastal waterway with my two children helping this man out of the plane. And I call Philip, and I go, Andrew, Eric, I'm call, excuse me, I call Sean and go, what were you thinking? They could have been really hurt. He goes, they weren't hurt. They were just the smallest ones that could get up there and help the guy get out. I said, Sean, they're children. He goes, Carol, you have got to stop holding these children so tightly. You've got them so regimented and so organized that they're not getting to experience life. Let them figure out who they are. I had it under control. And he really taught me a lot that day about living life, embracing life, and not being scared not being scared to live the life that we're supposed to lead. So he is still my favorite drummer. And you can see Sean walking down. That's Fort Pierce and then one of those amazing waves. They have great waves like that in Puerto Rico? That big, no. No, no. I think he's in South America. So part of my sabbatical was talking to some great dreamers. Mel Fisher, who passed away several years ago. I talked to his daughter. Mel Fisher is the one that discovered the shipwreck, the Atosha is called the shipwreck of the century. And Mel Fisher taught me a lot about directed passion. Because you see, on his way down to figure out where the Atosha was, he discovered a lot of other shipwrecks. But he had groupies that would follow him. 
And when he would discover these wrecks, he'd come back up and he'd look at the groupies and go, you can have it. I'm going to go find the Atosha. When he found the ship's cannon in 1976, it wasn't until 1984 that he found the mother load. He stayed and he searched and he searched and he searched for those ships. Did he have obstacles along the way? You bet. He lost his son Dirk in a boating accident and our U.S. government sued him 171 times wanting his treasure. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. He won every single court case. And Mel said, only in America can your country sue you because they want your treasure and you can still win. He believed it was one of the best places in the world to live. The only person that's ever rendered, rendered me speechless is Greg Skomel. Greg Skomel is the preeminent shark, uh, great white shark expert in our country. If you like Discovery Channel Shark Week, you're going to see Greg every year. I saw Greg on the television show three years ago, and his enthusiasm and his ability to make you love sharks and see his passion, I knew I needed to meet him. So I stalked him for a year, trying to figure out how I, how I could meet him. And so I sent him emails. I had an email address. I tried to Facebook friend him, and I never heard from him. Well, last summer, I said, I'm going to try one more time. So I Googled his name, and this phone number pops up. Never say what if, right? So I called the phone number, expecting to get a secretary or a recording. I had my whole monologue rehearsed. And all of a sudden, the phone rings, and this person goes, hello? And I go, hi, I'm Carol Hensberger from Tarrant County College, and I'm looking for Dr. Greg Skomel. This is Greg Skomel. How can I help you? And I dropped the phone. And then I start scrambling it, and I pick it up, and I'm trying to get myself composed, and I tell him about my project, and I say, I just want an hour of your time. I'd love to talk to you. Here's my private cell number. Why don't you give me a call next week? And what he told me was about choosing the difficult road. And I said, what, what would you suggest I teach my students? And he said, when they have a choice, if one road, even though it's difficult, leads them to their ultimate passion, tell them to choose that road. He said, when I graduated with a bachelor's degree in marine biology, I had two loves. My first love was sharks, great white sharks. My second love is coral reefs. And the only job opportunity when I graduated from college was to go to Britain and to study coral reefs. They were going to give me a small stipend, a fellowship at the university, room and board, and I'd be able to study coral reefs. The week before I left to go to Britain, I got a call from the Department of Marine Life Fisheries in Boston, Massachusetts. And they said, Greg, we don't have much money to offer you. We can't pay your scholarship but we'll give you a small salary if you'd like to come and study sharks and be a lab rat. And he said, I chose sharks. Even though it was much more difficult and I was eating macaroni and cheese for a long time, I still chose sharks because that was my first love. So oftentimes we get derailed. Something else takes our attention away from what we're supposed to do. Choose the tougher road. Got to interview this fireball, Cynthia Izaguera. Oh my gosh, she's so much fun. Uh, she definitely is a wonderful human being. And I like what she had to say. She said, tell your students, don't just say to treat people as they want to be treated. She said, tell them to treat people as though they would want them to treat their family. I think that's a really good piece of advice. Treat people as though you would want them to treat your family. And then, of course, my favorite person is Jean-Michel Cousteau. His father was the famous Jacques Cousteau. Every Sunday night when I was a little girl growing up, I watched Mutual of, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And then right after that was the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau invented the scuba tank. He's the reason a lot of us can go under the water and experience that beautiful world. He passed away um, in the in 1990s, but his son, Jean-Michel, has taken up the reins. And I wanted to talk to him about his dad and his work. He was a fascinating man to interview. So courteous and such a gracious man. At the end of the interviews, I always asked those that I interviewed, is there a question that you wish I would have asked you? Something that I can impart to my students? And he said, yes, you should have asked me what can I do for you? And I felt really bad. I said, you mean what I, Carol, can do for you? He goes, no, no. You should have asked, what can I, Jean-Michel, do for you? And I was really struck by that question because I really started thinking, what would our world be like if at the end of class I looked and I said, Melina, what can I do for you? Dalton, what can I do for you? Albert, is there anything I, I can do for you? Cheyenne, is there anything I can do for you? Wouldn't our world look completely different? 
What can I do for you? This man has given his life to saving the water on our planet. And he is still asking other people, what can I do for you? The great dreamers of our society are passionate, they are focused, and they definitely live the golden rule. Their life is all about doing for other people. And that's why they're able to dream the way that they do. So now it's your turn. It's time for you to start envisioning your goals and dreams. And we're going to kick off the Empowering the Dream program. I lost my father four years ago, and he was my biggest dreamer. And I was, I was lost. I literally was lost when my father passed away. And a girlfriend gave me this book written by Matthew Kelly called The Dream Manager. And when she first gave me this book, I was a little stubborn. I was obstinate. And I said, I don't need a book to dream. I'll just write my dreams and goals down. And I wrote 25. By the time I finished this book, I had written down over 125. And I came in and I tried this project with my students where I had them identify goals in different categories and marvelous things started happening. And the biggest thing that I realized was that my students were coming back the following semester. And my students were staying in school. And my students were directed to envision their dreams. As I traveled around the country, one of the things that I learned about dreaming was that small and big dreams, it doesn't matter the size. That our level of self-esteem, I'm going to take it back to the components of chapter two, the level of our self-esteem will increase whether we are embarking on a small dream, like cleaning out the garage, taking mom for dinner, or doing some big dream like graduating from college or interviewing some really important person. The size does not matter. What matters is that we accomplished it. And that accomplishment is what causes the, the, our self-esteem to be risen. So we, let's compare a steel girder and cables. Which one looks stronger to you? The steel girder or cable wire? The steel girder looks stronger, doesn't it? But actually, it's the cable wires. Because the steel girder, if it gets a break or a tear or it, the steel girder, has a problem, it can't support its weight. But the cable wire, if one of those cable wires becomes unraveled, the integrity of what it is supporting still holds. So let's take lots of little dreams. Let's wire them together, and that will help our self-esteem. I wanted to have a really good analogy on why big dreams are important, why we have to go for big dreams. So I decided that I was going to use the analogy of ripples in the water. So I took myself to a lake one day, and I wanted to prove that the bigger the dream, the bigger the boulder, the bigger the ripple, the bigger the effect on your life. That's what I set out to prove. So I had a whole pile of boulders here and a whole little pile of rocks, and I started throwing the boulders, and I started throwing the rocks. And you know what I discovered? That yes, when you throw a boulder in the water, it makes a bigger splash, but within the third circle, Within the third circle, the third ripple, it's the exact same size as the ripple of the smaller stone. So let's, let's embark on little dreams. If we want our life to be happy, healthier, have a more productive life, let's not, we, sure we should shoot for the moon, but let's figure out what we want our life to look like in other areas. The other thing that I found out, one of the things that uh, was asked the big question is, well, where do we start? If we're going to start dreaming, what are some of the areas in our life that we should look at? Because see, dreams have to be a balance. You can't just work and go to school. You can't just work and go to school. You have to look at some other areas of your life and get them in what I call homeostasis, get them in balance. First of all, you need to be physically fit. You have to be healthy to embark on dreams. You have to financially be able to afford it. Most dreams come with a price tag. You have to emotionally be able to do it. You have to be worthy. You have to believe that you are worthy, that you are capable, and that you have the ability to embark on this dream. And last, you have to have people in your life. You have to have healthy relationships, people that will support you and make those dreams come true. So if you were to say, Carol, I really want to start looking at my dreams and I want to go after them and figure out where they are and identify them, I would tell you to do those four first. Get physically healthy financially stable, like who you are, and, and start working on your relationships. This is like a teeter-totter. So the board of our teeter-totter is your spiritual dreams. And I, I'm not just talking about religion dreams. I'm talking about introspection. 
Who do you want to be? What is your spirit? How do you feed that spirit? How do you feed who you are? Certainly, they can be religious dreams. I want to read the Bible cover to cover. I want to go um, and walk the Camino in Spain. I want to go on a seven-day retreat. Absolutely, that's part of spiritual dreams. But it also could be, I want to go sit quietly for a day by the lake and just think and just figure out who I am. So once you have, this is the, called a fulcrum on a teeter-totter. Once you have your fulcrum and you've got your spiritual dreams identified, we have two different kinds. We have intellectual, vocational, and material dreams. And then we have imaginative travel and recreational dreams. I'm going to be handing to you in just a moment here your first inventory, where I'm going to ask you to go out and to decide, list all your desires. I want you to list your desires in the physical category. I want you to list your desires in your relational category. I want you to list your desires in travel. Where do you want to go? I want you to list your desires in the material things. What do you want to buy? I want you to list your desires intellectually, vocationally. And then on your graph, you're going to put if it's a fantasy, a fantasy, if it's a dream, or if it's a goal. A fantasy is a desire. It's a daydream. It's a wish. I fantasize about standing on a stage, singing at a concert, and being Pat Benatar. Is that probably ever going to happen? No. But is it fun to daydream about it? That's a fantasy. Right? A dream. A dream is your bucket list. A dream is someday when I have enough, I will do this. And dreams are free. You can dream all day long, but what do you want to do with your life? Goals are dreams with a deadline. Goals are dreams with a deadline. So I'm going to give you this seven page packet here in a minute that you're going to fill out and you're going to bring it to class next, next Tuesday and you're going to share with me what your dreams and your desires are. So let me just kind of make sure you have all this clear, the difference between them. Let's do a little thing. So here are some of my physical goals on dreams and desires. I want to do 200 jazzercise workouts. I want to live until I'm 96, and I want to have Dara Torres abs. Right. Which one is probably a desire or a fantasy? Abs. Abs, yep. I'd have to work really hard. I know I could do it, but I'd have to have a trainer and work out like she does 10 hours a day. I'm not going to do that. Which one is probably a dream? Live time 96. And I can do things, right, that will help me get there, but that's my dream, and that means my jazzercise workouts are a goal. Goals can be measured. You know when you've attained them. All right. So let's look at another one. Let's look at financial, my financial dreams. Which one is a fantasy? Winning, Winning the lottery. Which one is a dream? Okay, it could really be either one. My actual dream is to pay off the mortgage, and then I'd like to do something different in conjunction with teaching at 54. That's my goal. I'm paying off my mortgage, but I'm not working as hard at paying off my mortgage as I am saving for retirement. Does that, does that make sense? And let's do the last one. Material, all right? Which one is a desire, which one is a dream, and which one is a goal? The desire, yeah, the desire, it's a fantasy. Okay, 67 Stingray Corvette. Which the beach house? The beach house is my dream. And what's the bathroom remodel? Goal. Okay, goal. So what we're going to do is this is part one, part one of me beginning to teach you about empowering the dream. At the end of this semester, we will start talking about the last part of dreaming, which is getting other people to, to join our journey. So thank you. Chip for taping for me, and if you'll give me a minute, I'm going to start handing out your, your inventories.